Um, it is a pleasure. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce to you Madame Vivian Redin. Uh, she has been a, she is a former member of the European Commission. She has been member of the European Commission since 1999 until 2014, as you all know. We have already discussed all these details. A member of several European parliaments, the European Parliament, the Luxembourg Parliament, and the Atlantic, Assembly, Atlantic Alliance uh, Assembly, if I'm not mistaken. And the Benelux Parliament. And the Benelux Parliament. All right, so we are four. <laughs> That exists, that exists, right? Yeah. And she, as we have, this, we have mentioned this morning, she is responsible for many legislative initiatives that affect you as students, as consumers, as human beings, Europeans, mobility, and defense of, of fundamental rights, and uh, is really a pleasure to have you here. You cannot imagine. Now, the, the, the way we are going to proceed is um, you just you have a, 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 a you know, uh, to introduce the, sure, you, you could just go there. And, uh, and then we, they have prepared a lot of, this, a lot of uh, questions for you. So once you finish your intervention, then uh, we will have an open dialogue with all these young students over here. They have a lot of questions Thanks. for you, all kinds. Thank you. Now it works, yeah. Okay, thank you, Professor, and thank you for you be, uh, being here. I'm always very thrilled when I see the future in front of me, and here is the future, and I'm very thrilled because the future is interested about what's going on. Because you cannot build a future if you do not understand the past and analyze uh, what is going on in this moment. So it is very important that you know whatever decision Wherever you have to take those decisions, you have to know and take these decisions by yourself, independently, with your knowledge, with your experience, having learned the experience of the former generations. Now, because I'm sure your professors have told you a lot about Europe, I'm not going to make a long speech, just telling you how I see that this Europe has grown and how I see that it will continue to grow. If you expect from me to be negative, you can leave. I give you a minute to leave. Why I'm not negative? Because, you see, my, high, my whole life experience tells me that if you like to get things done, you have to approach them in a positive way. If you want to do nothing, then you can complain a lot. So choose in your life what you would like to do. Now, the founding fathers of the European Union, just after the Second World War, they had seen that this whole continent was uh, every 10, 20, 30 years there was again wars and whole generations wiped out and they said enough is enough, we'll stop this, we will try to do something in order to bring these fighting um, countries, these fighting nations together around a table. Now how are we going to do that? We don't know uh, because nobody had done that in the history of mankind before. So Europe was built in a sui generis system, which had never existed before, and it was built step by step. Not the whole thing bluffs there and we go for it, no. Let's start and build more and more and more, which I believe is still the true for today, and it was a very wise decision. So what did the founding fathers, sorry girls, uh, at that time there were no women in politics, so the founding fathers uh, decide, they said, okay, what do the nations need in order to make a war at that time? Eh? Steel and coal. So let's put steel and coal together that no nation by itself can anymore utilize its steel, its coal in order to start a new war. And so they started a common market hmm, with steel and coal in the beginning. Um, 
That developed slowly and slowly with the free movement of workers, market workers, not citizens at that time, it was only the very concrete way how you can bring workers from one place to another. So common market with some uh, goods and free movement of workers. And then all this developed over time into a real single market with the four freedoms. You know the four freedoms of the single market. It is the free movement of uh, capital, of money, of goods, of services, and of people. And why is this so important? You might have heard this now in our discussion with um, Great Britain. We cannot take one element out of these four freedoms. They are like a hand. They go together. You cannot take one away. You take the whole thing or you take nothing. But the four freedoms are a religion. They are holy uh, for us. Um, and then the euro was created, just like the Schengen uh, area was created, thinking, well, maybe not everybody can participate, but let's take those who want, who can, and then start to grow. We did the same thing with the Schengen area. You were smiling before when I said that I was a member of the Benelux parliament, but actually, Benelux, the uh, Luxembourg, Belgium, and the Netherlands, they had um, uh, an, a free movement area between those three countries before. So it was always like this, somebody tries something and then others jump on the back wagon and the thing becomes important. It worked like this with the Euro uh, and it worked like this with uh, Schengen, the free movement um, area. And the big change actually came with the Lisbon Treaty and the Charter of Fundamental Rights in 2009, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Yes? OK. Uh, why a big change? Because for the first time, Europe gave itself an extension of powers and something which you could call a constitution. Because with the Treaty of Lisbon, there is a Charter of Fundamental Rights, which is not called constitution, but which has constitutional rights, actually. It is linked. It has treaty value. And it is our Bill of Rights, like the Americans have one. By the way, you have to read this text. It's very short, but it says everything about the European values. And what is interesting is that from that moment on, the European Commission utilized the values inscribed in the Charter of Fundamental Rights in its lawmaking. European citizenship, which is a double citizenship. You are Spaniards and Europeans. I'm Luxembourger and European. There's no contradiction. It's like the small Russian dolls. One goes into uh, the other. Uh, or the justice policies, which were established at that moment before justice was completely in the hand of the national state. Then it became European for things which were linked to Europe. Erasmus generation. The generation which fell in love, a Spaniard with a Luxembourger, and um, they live in, um, in Berlin. Hmm? So international couples, love, babies, everything. By the way, we count that there are one million Erasmus babies around. Hmm? So you see, um, just these policies for uh, these Erasmus uh, couples, the international couples, because love is wonderful, but then you have a divorce uh, or somebody dies, you have a succession rights, cross-border, not easy. So to handle first these very concrete questions. And in the end, at the end of this year, there will be in Luxembourg the European Public Prosecutor mm -hmm. Office, which when I started to put that on the table, everybody thought I was completely nuts. Uh, because, I mean, a, a prosecutor, that is something which belongs to a state. 
Now we are going to have a European prosecutor step by step by step. He will be first responsible uh, for the crimes against the European uh, budget. But the second step will be the cross-border uh, criminality, uh, terrorism, and so on and so forth. So you see, we go step by step, slowly, slowly. And now we have a new commission, a new commission which says it is going to put several elements very high on the agenda. The geopolitics. Because if you look at the map of the world, you will see that there are several continents which are going to compete. For the time being, it is the United States, China, and Europe. And Europe can only survive, you can only survive in your future if Europe stays united and strong. Because imagine that Luxembourg says now, okay, I will do it my way. And France also, and Spain also, we count peanuts, nothing. It's only when we are together. We are at the moment the strongest organized uh, market in the world. We are still. When you will take over as politicians, as CEOs, we will not be number one anymore. I suppose that China will be number one. But you would like to take your own decisions, won't you? Not that China or the United States or whoever tomorrow will impose a decision on you, no. You like to like to be a standard maker and not a standard taker. And that is exactly where the new commission also lies to go. Um, geopolitical uh, power of the European Union first, and then on the two very big problems which we have to start to solve so that the next generation still can have um, a, a beautiful Europe, and a Europe with um, rule of law, and a Europe with uh, an economy which works, and with, well, it's nice living, simply. Well, that is our environment. Uh, we have to uh, build on the Paris Agreement in order to save our planet, and that is going to cost a lot of money and a lot of energy and a lot of action together. And the second, because we are in a complete change of the digital world. Um, if we are not a first mover in this change from the uh, social media world, to a platform world where data are the uh, driver of the economy and of the society, it will be imposed to us. So also there, first mover, we have seen how you can do that. Um, and that will be the end of the story I tell you now. But because it is a, a very good point to understand why geopolitical policy has to be done first at home. When I became a commissioner for justice, uh, I had to apply the Treaty of Lisbon, of course, and the Charter of, Bill of, uh, on the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And in the Treaty of Lisbon and in the Charter of Fundamental Rights, there is one article which says that private data belong to the human being and not to somebody else. And I looked at this in reality and I saw that private data did not belong to the human being anymore, to the person. It belonged to everybody around, but not to you. So my responsibility was to apply in real term a right which was offered to our citizens to apply it also in practice. I was looking at the legislation, 28 conflicting legislations, nearly not applied, uh, efficiency zero. I say, okay, easy, get rid of 28 legislation, replace it by one, one law for one continent, that is fine. Second, if you are a startup, let's say you build your own startup here in Barcelona, and you start to have a little success, but you want to work with your startup in the whole of the European market. It is your market, isn't it? So you need to have an easy access to this market without barriers. But if you have different rules on uh, privacy in each member state, 
then uh, instead of hiring somebody who knows about data, you have to hire five or six lawyers in order to tell you how you have to behave when you cross a border. Ridiculous. So also for all companies, wherever they go on this market, the same. One continent, one rule for all citizens and for all companies operating on this territory. And you know what was happening? Well, we were making this rule. I don't I make a long story short because it was very complicated, but in the end we did it. And in the end, the European legislation became a world standard, which is now taken up in more and more member states in more and more states around the world in order to copy it or to adapt to it. The European Union doesn't make any trade agreement anymore without the uh, partner having um, uh, uh, the data protection and privacy in its national laws. So by our force, by being together, by thinking in the same time about our people and about our economy, and that makes us special, because other places of the world do not think in an equilibrium between people and economy. Europe does, and that is our specificity. And I must tell you, I'm very proud to be European. And I'm, every time I, I, I travel in other continents, I'm so happy to come back. Huh? Because really, not only that it is beautiful, OK, you find beautiful spots all over the world, but you feel comfortable because you know you have rights, you have the rule of law, and you have people who are looking for your good. You are not oppressed, you are a free person. And I think that is important, that we want to keep, and that we can only keep with a strong Europe. Now it's on your questions. Thank you very much. Now we just opened up to the dialogue. Um, so the floor is yours. Um, anyone having a question for uh, Madame Redding? Just, just raise your hand. You have the option. And then you get the mic. Stay here or sitting down? It's up to you. Yeah, I must stay here or yeah, you can yeah, take we'll this and I go well, down. This is for a student. Ah, you, that, there you, too. I go down. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, who is the first one who likes to take questions? Women first. You're absolutely right. I come to this side. <laughs> Um, so, well, uh, talking about women first, that's probably what my question's about. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I was reading an article you wrote for The Guardian in November 2012, which is called, uh, It's Time to Break the Gas Ceiling for Europe's Women. And in this article, uh, you were talking about uh, how the plan for Europe was to have, by the year 2020, 40% uh, of representation of women in corporate boards. However, in 2019 report on equality between women and men in the European Union, uh, the m percentage is way lower, it's around 26%. France being the only country, about 40%. And Italy. Oh yeah, Italy I think is also, but yeah. Yeah, well my question was more, how do you think Europe could fix that? Should we focus more on quotas or? Well, look how we fix it. We have a female president of the European Commission, a female president of the European uh, Central Bank, and a female president of the World Bank. Good starting point, isn't it? And uh, Madame uh, President has really insisted that she has uh, a very high number of uh, female members of the Commission. So, by doing, by pushing it through, by changing the mentality, when I came, when I got the dossier in my hands of equality, I saw that the equality was nowhere. Uh, we still have very big differences in, in, um, in the revenue for the same work, the uh, pay gap, we call that. Um, and uh, women in power positions were not to be found. Now, you have two possibilities to do it. You have to, can do it bottom up, by education, takes enormous time. So I thought I would do it by role models. Um, if you are a young woman 
and you go to business and you see that there are other women there, you say, I can do it also. If you are a young woman, you go to business and you start to work and there's no woman there and everybody is oppressing you, uh, you say, I will never manage. So it's important to have the role models. That's why I had the idea to have quotas for bringing women into the um, uh, Conseil d'administration, into the boards of uh, listed companies. My goodness, you cannot imagine what the male business world was doing, shouting. That was the end of our social market system. It was the end of our companies. They had really all to, to collapse. So until now, the law is not enforced at the European level. But what has happened? I went to see the women's organizations the journalist organizations, the political organizations of all, all parties, um, the lawyers, and so on, so on. And I told them, girls, you have to help. I cannot do that alone. And they were helping. They started in television, in the newspapers, in conferences, the debate about this. And they got the pledges, finally, uh, from the companies. And today, companies feel ashamed if they do not have women in their boards. By the way, it's a very bad idea, because boards where men and women work together make the best uh, economic results, for the simple reason that it is a combination of both talents and of both sensitivities uh, which makes that companies work well. And why um, the differences in our member states Simply because in France, they made a law. France has always been uh, very advanced on uh, questions of uh, female, uh, females in the working place. And in Italy, there were two gorgeous members of parliament. A rather elderly woman from the Christian Democrats and a very young woman from the Socialists. And they decided, we two together, we make a law proposal. They put the quote rose, the rosa quotas. They put it on the table and none of their female, of their male colleagues had the courage to vote against. <laughs> so Italy very uh, soon had this law on the quote rose and that changes also the action because the companies are forced to have women on board. Well, 10 years is a long time. I think the mentalities have changed. I think that now all the companies are um, going for talent. And if you go for talent, the talent is with the females and with the males. You have the good ones, the less good ones. And we need talent in Europe. We cannot afford to have half of our talent be put in a corner. It doesn't work anymore. And that is why um, I believe very strongly that slowly, slowly problems are going to be changed. And you see, if I would have said 10 years ago that one day we are going to have the three more Im most important um, institutions um, with a, a female president, nobody would have believed it. But today it seems nice, normal. So we are on a good way. Okay, I want to ask about the Mercosur trade agreement because in the point 14 it includes clauses regarding the upholding of the Paris Agreement, fight against deforestation and fines against the use of, of recently deforestated areas for cropping. But I want to ask how much can the uh, European Union trust partners such as Brazil who under the new government has been clearly deforestating and being a menace to climate stability and if there are any mechanisms in those kind of agreements to enforce the environmental standards. Trust is nice, control is better. And uh, that is why, because also you, you, you said it very clearly, uh, if I make an agreement with you uh, today and you are the boss of a company, huh, and in two years you are gone, uh, your company has to 
uh, cling with the agreement, and not the next boss saying, okay, I don't agree with this. And that is why in our trade agreements, uh, as you have rightly quoted, so we put the um, environmental, um, labor, um, labor for instance, no child labor allowed, um, and social uh, um, elements, GDPR, uh, data protection, we put it into our agreements, and if the other party does not uh, keep the rules, then we have retaliation uh, measures. But you never want to come to retaliation measures. You try to solve problems before. So, yes, uh, trust is, you have to have trust to make an agreement, but to keep an agreement, uh, you need to have a very uh, solid look at it. I had seen him first, so who is, who is, who is the next? No, 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 go, go ahead, go ahead. So come back there, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's true that uh, the EU is an example for the international world uh, as a model of union and integration, but also as part of the history, it's important to think too about the dark side too of Europe. Especially we know that Europe historically yes. historically has has been poor with raw material. And what do you think about the that he, that dark history of Europe, especially regarding the exploitation of European countries in Latin America and Africa and what is happening in that region of the world reality that we have, we have many big problems of all kinds. But it's like, what do you think, too, about the dark side of Europe? Well, it was exactly the dark side of Europe which made us to create Europe. Uh, because uh, Europe is many member states, many states, which through centuries have had a very negative uh, action. Not only Europe, also uh, other parts of the world. and. Uh, all the wars, the exploitation uh, in Africa, in, uh, in mostly in Africa, um, all this has been changed by wanting to have a system built on the rule of law. So that was very important, to have rules, a rule-based system, and to develop also um, our a, a Part, an important part of our business is in order to help the regions outside European Union. Uh, Europe is the biggest um, uh, uh, economic uh, uh, help giving in the whole world. Mm? So uh, we have a responsibility there, but of course those countries have also a responsibility to keep the rules. So Europe is a good example what you can do if there are dysfunctions. You have to create a legal system with checks and balances and with a court, which is very important. The European Court of Justice has an enormous power in a positive sense, because it corrects if uh, the political leaders do something uh, in their decision making or in their application, which would not be uh, fair according to the um, commonly agreed basic rules. So a system based on the um, rule of law and with the control mechanisms built on the rule of law are very, is very important. I have, you, you have a, yeah. <laughs> okay, since I have the microphone. Uh, thank you for your talk and for reminding, reminding us of the perks of Europe and the things we actually take for granted. I'm saying it as a non-EU member state citizen. I'm from Serbia, from the Western Balkans, and therefore I'm gonna ask you a question regarding the neighborhood and enlargement policy. So now it's a hot topic, Western Balkans and what's happening. And I'm actually asking just because of the Euroscepticism, which is also rising in the country where I'm coming from regarding the EU membership. So what is your opinion? Are we likely to expect membership in the years to come? And how many years we're going to wait more for it? Thank you. The EU membership is not uh, for a zero. It goes with a lot of uh, conditions. 
And that is why before a um, state can become member of the European Union, it has to fulfill all these conditions. And normally the time before uh, a state is ripe to enter the European Union is a long time. I have negotiated part of the agreement with Croatia. Uh, I have negotiated the justice part of it. And I can tell you, uh, in one and a half years, four ministers of justice have given up uh, <laughs> because they had to sleep in their office. So difficult it was to build up a an, an well-functioning uh, justice system in a country which wa was coming out of the communist non-justice system. Uh, area, so had to do everything from scratch. Just telling you this, uh, and the Copenhagen criteria, uh, which uh, com with, with all the rule of laws, uh, with all the rule of law uh, uh, conditions, and then the economic conditions which have to be fulfilled, is a long procedure. Uh, so it doesn't go from one day to another. So that is one thing. That's a technical thing. Now the political thing. Um, if you look at the map of Europe, uh, you see very well that uh, the continent misses a part uh, between Central Europe and Southern Europe, the whole Balkans. And you know also what kind of wars there were in the Balkans, and still it's difficult to keep the different populations uh, which hate each other because there has been a lot of terrible things happening uh, to make them smoothly going into a democratic uh, system. We have, as European Union, promised to the Balkan that they would one day become member of the European Union. Personally, I believe Pacta Sunt Servanda which means if you make such a promise, and that, that is not a, just a promise, I, I promise you we go for a coffee afterwards. Huh? Uh, it, it is an existential uh, promise for those countries. You have to keep this promise under the condition that things are going smoothly to the right direction. You think probably about um, President Macron and his blocking of the process. Now, that brings me to another political element. There is a very big enlargement fatigue with our uh, um, populations. Now, you are coming from a country which would like to enter the European Union, and you have a fatigue because um, things are lasting too long. In my part of the world, there is this fatigue again, somebody else, and we have to pay, and, 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 and. You see, you have these two points of view. And if you do not have politicians who are strong and who go for it, and are just listening to what people say at a certain moment, then it goes wrong. So it is a complicated thing, but geography is a clear thing. And geography shows you that, yes, of course, it is an anomaly um, to leave this part of Europe outside of the Union. How long will it take? I cannot give you this answer. It will continue to be complicated on both sides, on your side, which has to comply with all the rules, and on our side, which has to have um, to persuade the populations that it is a good thing to do. But in the end. Okay, now I, I'm lost. I you. You don't have? I can't. Well, first of all, thank you very much for coming to UPF. Um, you mentioned the success of the Erasmus program. Uh, I think it was two days ago that the Commission released the 2018 annual report. And now we know that since 1978, 10 million European citizens have had the possibility of participating in the Erasmus program. However, as far as I'm concerned, the Erasmus program still today remains being quite an elitist program because only those who can afford traveling abroad or th only those who don't, do not have any kind of physical barrier to travel abroad can participate. So I would, last, I would like to ask you what can be done to make the, the Erasmus program more inclusive 
and what role do you think local communities like us play in doing so? Thanks. Well, you know that Erasmus is the only European policy which has its own film. Eh? Uh, so, and here in Barcelona. <laughs> have you seen this film? Yeah, you have seen it. Um, I was responsible in my first term for the Erasmus program, and that was, uh, my first term was 20 years ago. I was quite uh, in the beginning of uh, Erasmus, so uh, what I did at that moment uh, was to open Erasmus to the world, Erasmus Mundus, because I thought it would be beyond uh, going to Barcelona and having big fun uh, sharing an apartment. <laughs> um, it would also be interesting for our students to have the possibility, the possibility to uh, go to the United States, to go to China, to go uh, to Brazil or wherever. Uh, so I opened this possibility and I started to make agreements with um, states outside of the European Union in order to have an Erasmus window. And at that moment also, the I asked universities to take initiatives so that they would make joint ventures between universities in Europe and universities outside of Europe. And then the second element which I tried to establish, but um, I didn't manage to get it through, because I saw, well, university is nice, fantastic, nine million and so on. Uh, we had also uh, the uh, primary and secondary schools, but not as individual students, as groups uh, in links with other um, schools, nice. But there was a hole in the whole thing, professional training. Um, I, uh, how you call that in, in Spain, professional? Yeah, okay. So uh, the people uh, who are not continuing their, um, their intellectual uh, um, studies, but they are uh, learning a craft. And uh, you see where the whole Erasmus idea started actually was from these people. Because in the Middle Ages, when you wanted to become a craftsman, you had to go from, from crafts from, from, from uh, city to city to learn with established uh, uh, craftsmen your um, profession. And I thought it would be why we have started with universities only and we leave those who are uh, working in a craft outside. So I'm happy to tell you that now the craftsmen and the, the people who are doing this, uh, I don't know the terminology, uh, can... How, how is l'apprentissage? Um, yeah. Um, the, uh, apprenticeships. Apprenticeships. Hmm? So those who are in apprenticeships that they can again do it in the middle age um, uh, style. That's not so, that's easily said but not so easily done because it is also the recognition of uh, the um, time you work uh, with, with a master. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that is different from the different member states. Uh, on. So it is not easy, but uh, we are on the way to do that. Now, the finances, of course, is um, a problem and that stays a problem. Europe does not have enough money in order to pay the whole um, system. It can only give help to the system. So it's true that uh, your family, if you want to do an Erasmus, your family or yourself by working during, in, in summer and uh, making some money, you, you, you have to have uh, a little money in your hand before you can do it. But I do not see that we can change that. The money will certainly not be enough. Now, that are the flaws of the whole thing. But think about one million Erasmus babies. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Thank you for being at UPF. First of all, well, and I think one can say you are for um, very deep European integration, maybe even a United States of Europe at one point um, from your Futures for Europe initiative. Um, well, as economists, 
we think it's pretty clear that for a stable long-term Europe, we would need greater fiscal integration on a European level as well. But maybe even more uh, labor mobility and flexibility than we have today. So my question is, in the context of, well, the very different European cultures, what do you think could be like a bonding element to increase the European demos or in other words, what could be the mission to the moon for Europe, like a common, a common uh, goal apart from the EU itself? Thank you. I am one of those who always believed in the United States of Europe. Um, to make it clear, that's not the United States of America. Europe is not the melting pot. It will never become. We will always have the cultural diversity, which, to my opinion, is our big wealth. So maybe the terminology was also not right, because nobody likes to give up his uh, culture, his language, his uh, way of living, and so on and so forth. So uh, our way of... but. Um, stronger integration is absolutely necessary, and I still do believe that. But to have a stronger uh, integration, you would need a new treaty. Now, we have some problems in Europe to find unanimity today. If you only take somebody like Orban in Hungary or Kaczynski in Poland, uh, who are in this moment dismantling the rule of law and an independent judiciary, you can understand that a stronger Europe, which would have more means in order to force these deviations to the right way, uh, will never find their agreement. So it would be irrealistic in this moment to go for this dream. Maybe your generation will take it up. But that does not mean that we are standing still. You might have seen that um, the president of the European Commission, together with the president of the parliament and the president of the council, have pledged to have an, a future of Europe uh, uh, convention uh, going, uh, starting. Um, not one as we had the last one, where it were only the constitutionalists uh, sitting together uh, trying to, um, to push uh, for, uh, for a closer um, uh, union, but it would be with the people, with a lot of uh, public citizens' dialogues, like the one we have today, but then on specific uh, uh, questions, uh, where we would ask the opinion of citizens in um, the different member states. I personally believe that we can do a lot of reforms, staying with the treaties as they are, uh, because the treaties very often give us a way out. If you are in politics, you have to have a lot of imagination sometimes. Huh? Um, everything I did uh, was possible with the treaties. But everybody told me it's not possible, you can't do that. You will never win this. Yeah, but if it is possible, technically speaking, even by <laughs> making a small slalom, then you need the political will to do it. Look, roaming. Do you think that those super big uh, telecom companies were agreeing? No. They all went to their minister of finance and they said, your country is going bankrupt if we are losing all this money because we do not give you this money anymore as taxes in order to put in your budget. So all the ministers of finance were against. In the end, we won it but it was a 10-year fight. And you need to, to, to lead the fight. You need to find allies, because you can never do an, anything like something like this alone. You need to have strong enough allies who go with you to, for the same thing, and you need to have a lot of long-term investment. But I do believe that the changes will occur Maybe not all uh, those which have been announced, but a part of those. I do believe that changes will occur there where we do not have a choice. That is, for instance, the environment, and that is a digital development. <laughs> there, uh, there is no way out. Huh? We do it or we fail. But 
really, as a continent. So that, this we will do. All the others will need a very strong leader, a good commissioner, and uh, good allies around. So yes, um, we can have economic uh, stronger uh, living together. We have an, uh, um, also um, in the, on the social uh, element, on the, so on the social level, uh, the idea to have some kind of minimum income, which would not be a horizontal one. Uh, because poorer your EU countries cannot have the same minimal income as Luxembourg. It would destroy their, their, um, their economy completely. But to have a minimum income as, as a job guarantee and as a social security guarantee for the human being, this we can do. I know very well the new uh, Commissioner for Social Affairs, who is a Luxembourger, and um, he really wants uh, to get it done. I wish him well, and I think he will get a minimum. But Step by step, you see. Okay, the girl again. So thank you so much for your time and being here, explaining all these wonderful stories and leading the way. Um, so as a European, I feel a bit um, fear because of the climate change crisis happening. And then I came across the lecture you did for the Jean Monnet in... Um, in the UK in 2001, saying that the European Union will be a union that will um, reply to the needs of social, local, and environmental um, problems or issues. And it's been a while. I understand that things need to be done like step by step, and you prove it by example. I mean, you get one thing done at a time. But I think that right now there's an issue because we, we don't have these 10 more years. I mean, 10 more years, we are already in the agenda of 2030 with the Sustainable Development Goals and so on, which the Commission already agreed to that. And they put the like, uh, climate emergency and so on. But I fear that maybe it's a bit too late. Could have something be done before? Thank you. Yes, we should have done before. Certainly. But we didn't. Certainly. Um, we are where we are now, with a complete environmental urgency. I mean, uh, Trump still hasn't understood it, but I think that you have understood it. The young people have really understood because it is their future. And um, all the experts, all the experts, all the scientists have calculated uh, what is going uh, to happen. So the European Commission uh, is working on a Green Deal, uh, which says what needs to be done, not top down, but bottom up, in the different member states, in order to get the problem under control, not to solve the problem, because that's too late, but to get it under control, that it doesn't go to the absolute catastrophe where it will go if we don't do anything. We will need a lot of money for doing this. And the good news here is that those who have the money, for instance, the European Investment Bank um, or uh, the European Central Bank, <coughs> they have pledged to green bonds, to green investments, and they are really working on this. It's, it's not, uh, the, the European Investment Bank is already doing that now several years, and it's going to reinforce its action. We have a need, um, as uh, the Commission has calculated uh, globally in the whole European Union, that means not only at the level of Europe, but also at the level of local communities, of roughly 200 uh, billion euros uh, per year. And that, that is a cost we have to invest into this. This cannot come from the European budget, because the European budget is too small for this. But the European budget has pledged a fund for helping those areas in Europe which to simply do not have the money, because we have these um, this, uh, economic differences in Europe, to help those out. Um, the rich ones to do it uh, by themselves, um, uh, the medium ones to get a little help, and the poor ones uh, to, to give them the push to go ahead, with the help of the money which exists, 
in the European Investment Bank, we have a chance. But we have to understand that we do not have time for discussing anymore. It is time for action, because it is already late. And I mean, we see it around the world how, how late it is and, and, and how many extreme uh, eff effects we have. So yes, you are right, we should have started this before. But sometimes uh, you have to have the nose in the dirt before you have seen that uh, there was a, a problem and you were falling down. So we have the nose in the dirt now and we have to, to move. And actually, I'm one of those who is very happy that the young people went to the street. I think that was important. Um, not to say that uh, they are better in the street than, than studying, I think they have to do both, uh, but uh, to, to, to go out and to say we, uh, we got enough of this. Move, move, go ahead. And I think that they went everywhere in all member states and uh, so many young kids and sometimes the, the grandmother came with them and the dog also. So uh, it, it, was, it was interesting. It was interesting and it was a wake-up call. And I think this pressure should continue. You should engage in all the levels where you are into this discussion and say that you do not want to wait for political actions to be taken, but you need them to be taken now. If not, not my generation, but your generation is going uh, to suffer. So yes, we are behind of this. <laughs> so many hands, I don't... You have already. You, you, no, he, no, okay. Yeah. The average gross salary per hour in Bruxelles is 44 hour, while in Bulgaria is four hour, uh, four euro per hour. In comparison with the European average that is 22.68. How necessary do you think is a European wage indexed to the cost of living in order to have a fairer labor market, avoiding the recent phenomena of production delocalization towards European uh, Union countries of Visegrad? Thank you. Yeah, uh, that is exactly the same or a similar question which has been asked uh, just before. Um, we have very big... Uh, differences in income in general. Look, I'm coming from one of the wealthiest countries in the world, Luxembourg, um, where wages are extraordinarily high. But that means also that a cleaning lady has a wage in Luxembourg probably like a um, professor in Spain. Uh, yeah? Mm? Yeah? 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 Oh, well, I don't go until Spain. I, I, I take only an, a bus driver. A bus driver in Luxembourg is earning the double than a bus driver in Belgium because the general income levels are very different. So you always have to see the minimum income as a fair price according to the general income. You know that Europe is a solidarity model. And our biggest element in the European budget uh, are the funds, the agricultural fund, the regional fund, the social fund, in order to help the regions or the countries which are low to grow an own production uh, possibility. You have the differences and you are, cannot wipe them out. Um, we are not... an. But you have those differences even in, in, in the United States, for instance, depending on where you are in the United States. But there you have no guarantee at all, even not a health care guarantee. So what we like to do in Europe is that at least according to the environment, you have a guarantee minimum. Um, and you have also um, a health care system which is fair correct and which can help the human being. So on this we can work. Eliminate from one day to another the, um, the cost structures, uh, income structures, the wealth structures of our region, that will not be possible. But um, by helping them out, I mean, 
if I look uh, how the situation was how the situation was in Bulgaria before and after before they joined the European Union and after they are in the European Union is day and night uh, because everything has gone up also the well-being of the populations, the, the, the income of the populations has gone up. But there is still a huge difference between Bulgaria and Luxembourg. Because Bulgaria has started so long after Luxembourg. Uh, so you need time in order to have these economic developments. But this your economic professors are going to tell you better than I can. Uh, we are working on equality, which does not mean being the same but it means in your environment having a fair treatment. That is what we are working on. Thank you very much. I would like to ask um, how would European Union um, manage the crisis of the, right, the rise of right-wing populism nowadays? Thanks. If I knew the answer. Hmm. <laughs> Why before you can solve a problem, you have to see where the problem is coming from. Why all of a sudden all this right-wing populism, where you see, when you look at where it is originated, uh, it is originated in places where the job situation is not good and the education system is not good. Frustrated people. Elections in the United States. Where did Trump get the, money, the, the, the votes from? From this absolutely frustrated, left alone parts of the populations in, for instance, the Rust Belt, uh, where steel industry simply didn't work anymore. Uh, so, and if you look in Europe, it is very often the same. Um, this goes together with an information society built on the internet, where the fake news or the targeted uh, advertising is very easy to be done. Give you the example of what has happened uh, during the British referendum, where the anti-Europeans, they got the help of uh, the company uh, Cambridge Analytica, uh, led by Bannon, the councillor of Trump, and financed by Mercer, a very uh, rich family in the United States. In order to do what? In order to produce targeted ads linked to the personality of the person who was receiving those ads. Now, they got also a lot of... Um, data from Facebook. Hmm? Facebook handed over uh, hundreds of thousands of data to this company and they addressed themselves to this uneducated, frustrated part of the population in order to tell them that the problem of all, uh, that the problem uh, for all their terrible things uh, is Europe and the solution is getting out of Europe. So this was the basis for experience and they have applied the same thing also in, um, in the United States. Uh, now they are bankrupt in Europe, but they are working still in 68 nations of the world, helping mostly dictators to win the next elections. So frustrated people who are turning their ears to fake news um, and to extremism is not a European uh, alone phenomenon. It has become, unfortunately, a worldwide phenomenon and it is not becoming smaller, it is growing. Now, I know that there are a lot of um, initiatives taken uh, the Commissioner for Justice, uh, uh, Jourova, has made a speech uh, yesterday, I think, on uh, how to, uh, to, to, to break down uh, fake news, at least. 
I see that very difficult because I'm coming from communication science. And I have analyzed uh, how communication functions now. You know that on the internet, um, a doomsday a fake news message goes six times more quickly than an objective message and reaches out to six times more people, or ten times more people, but six times more quickly. So, and you have seen it also, what happened to the uh, Ohinia in uh, Burma. Uh, you have seen what, uh, how uh, the, the violence of Christchurch has been amplified uh, by um, fake news on the internet. So that we have a very big danger which is linked to the uh, social network infrastructure. The good news here is that so social media infrastructure still have a lot of income, but their reputation is bust. And everywhere, the problems in, in the developed uh, world, in the democratic world, the, the problems are starting to become uh, evident and uh, the politicians, the political leaders are starting to fight back. But it's not easy. Huh? Because this equilibrium which you have, you have to find between what Americans would call free speech, <laughs> we have free speech at any rate in Europe, um, and uh, controlling uh, fake news is a very delicate balance. Not easy to, to do. It's easy to say, but to do it in practice is really not easy. Who has? Hello. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. In 2016, so for those who didn't hear me, you stated that the problem of the EU was not the EU itself, but the players of the game, so the heads of the states, etc., um, which maybe didn't want to follow the same rules as the rest. And uh, my question was then uh, more a personal question: What do you think? Where do you think the EU is going? So should we actually let the people who wants to leave leave and make it easier for them to leave, such as the Brexit, or should we try to include them as well and um, still pretend uh, to look strong economically, or yeah. do we need to be like maybe l less in number but maybe strong, more strongly linked yeah. to each other? Okay, that is, um, that is a question, shall we be big Europe or a concentrated uh, circle uh, Europe? Well, um, but you have so many questions in your question, I would like to answer. Because people who want to leave, uh, before the Brits were starting to leave, there were many who thought it might be a good idea. Since the Brits have started to leave, I have not seen a single other member state who thinks it would be a good idea. And it's interesting to see that um, the people who believe that Europe is a solution um, were rather low before Trump and Brexit. With Trump and Brexit, the, um, the percentage of people who think Europe is a good solution has risen very strongly because people start to think also what is the advantage uh, of being. Well, okay, so uh, why did I say that the problem is not the institutions? It's not the European Commission which makes good proposals. It's not the European Parliament which is very European-minded and uh, goes towards finding solution. It is the Council of European Ministers where very often the ministers are putting the foot on the brake. Great Britain, for instance, managed to stop 12% of the proposals uh, of the European Commission. 
nobody knows that. Um, but that is what is happening in the Council of Ministers. The Council of Ministers is undoing things. Why can the Council of Ministers do that? Because it's absolutely not transparent. The Commission is very transparent. All decisions are explained in a daily press conference to the uh, journalist. Um, before a decision goes out, it is explained, it is Everybody knows how it came upon, and in the European Parliament, all the discussion meetings even are public. So everybody can see who is doing what, who is saying what. The only place in the world where nothing is public is in the Council of Ministers. And then you have the ministers who at home say, oh, I went to Brussels, and I, and I, and I, but behind closed doors has just done the contrary. And nobody finds out. That's why I always said we need to have more transparency in the Council of Ministers, so that at least when you are a German, hmm, and your German minister has gone to the Council and fucked it up again, <laughs> that you know at least that has done a stupidity. Huh? Now you cannot know. So, you see, that is what I believe should be done in order to solve this problem. That was the meaning of what I said. Now, the other question, should we um, have a new enlargement even, make this Europe bigger, or should we go to the core Europe and advance with six, seven, eight, uh, countries in an open way and leave others then to uh, to come in. I was always opposing this uh, position because I always believed that we have to advance together. After having seen what I have seen in my political experience, um, I think that it might be the only solution in the future. But let's first see what will come out of our discussions on the future of Europe. Because I think that is also a point which has to be discussed there. Hmm? Not only some of us doing it. Um, you know who had the idea to, to go for um, a Europe of uh, concentric centers? Wolfgang Schäuble. He was the one who pleaded for this since years and years, and I had fights with him since years and years because I pleaded for the contrary. I had to say three years ago to Wolfgang Schäuble, you were right. He said, but I know I was right, <laughs> as, he, as he is as a character. A thing to be discussed in um, the future um, citizens' dialogues, uh, which we will have all over the place. How much time do we have? So, who, but you see better maybe than me. Who, to whom should we give the... Uh, we take maybe short questions. He's discriminating. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I saw it. Positive discrimination. Yeah. But maybe we make short questions, we make two or three, and then we wrap up. Mm, yeah, okay, I'll go fast. Well, this question is uh, regarding democracy in Europe, and it's true that we go for elections to the European Parliament. However, uh, it's also true that our representation of one vote is really indirect. So, um, do you believe this system uh, can do better in order to gain maybe the trust of the European citizen? Because maybe um, the European citizen doesn't see himself as a true representative or to representation in Europe? Yes. <laughs> I was always uh, for at least having, having the national lists, but also having a transnational list. I would have loved to make once an election campaign on a transnational list. Uh, I will not. <laughs> um, but maybe you will. Why is it difficult, a transnational list? It's difficult first because all the other parliamentarians who have been elected on a national list will think those on the transnational list, uh, elected on the transnational list, will think they are something better. Hmm? First problem. Psychological, but very important. And then uh, member states are against because that means they would need to give up some of their national posts. 
Mm? Because you know it's a pro rata distribution of the positions in parliament um, uh, for this uh, uh, transnational list. So it, it's a difficult question. And frankly, well, although it would have been fun for me, I speak also some languages and I understand uh, the cultural diversity would have really been fun to, uh, to do it. But um, uh, I'm not sure it will work. On the contrary, what I believe is that the election of a president of the European Commission, because that people can understand. Huh? They have five or six candidates from different countries, probably none of their country of origin, and uh, they are going around in order to become president of the European Commission. To have such an election uh, by the people, I can imagine. It will be easier than to, to have this mixed a thing of, uh, of, of, of national selection, sometimes regional selections. I think in your place it's a regional uh, vote for the European... Um, yeah, well, it, it depends. Some countries have an, a national vote, others have a regional vote, and um, some have the parties who put you number one or two. I'm coming from a country where the people put you number one or two is a cross behind the name. So. Uh, to, to bring all this to one system will be very, very difficult. And I'm not sure it will be a value, an, a value added, with the exception of uh, the um, Spitzenkandidat system, where I'm for. Um, yes? You, you do it. We, we take all the questions. Together. Yes. Awesome. Um, so back in 2013, when uh, Edward Snowden revealed to the world that uh, a lot of the heads of uh, state were under surveillance, like Angela Merkel uh, and stuff, I was just wondering what your initial reaction was back then and whether you thought you were being I answer to. you at once. Thank you. Because my GDPR, my data protection thing was going nowhere. I had an in because of the American lobbying, uh, very efficient uh, on in, in the different member states in, in the capitals, because not transparency also there. Um, more difficult in European Parliament, but at, I was nowhere. And when Snowden came out, I sat there and I said, thanks, Lord, thanks, Lord. The day after, I had a majority in Parliament and in council. My question is also about digitalization. Uh, does the EU see uh, building capacities like infrastructure or getting digital skills or uh, educating IT staff as a problem? And whose responsibility to tackle this? Yes, education is in the hand of the national states, sometimes even on, of the regions. In Germany, for instance, it's not Berlin who's responsible for education programs, it is a different lender. So um, uh, Europe can only be a helping hand. Uh, we are lagging behind enormously because we are missing so much trained engineers, technicians, or just uh, computer savvy uh, people that you cannot imagine. Uh, and we will not manage in our uh, data driven uh, future if we do not have those people. The second element is that many of the people who are in a job now have to be retrained, lifelong learning, but not only as a slogan, in real terms. They have to be retrained or they will be useless. Uh, in, in a data-driven uh, system. So uh, there we do have a problem because the reforms of the education system is generally very heavy and very slow. And we don't have time. And the second problem is that we do not have the, the teachers to teach the teachers. Because very many teachers feel also um, aggressed due to the fact that sometimes the students or the pupils know more about technology than they do. So here, I, one of the biggest problems we, and when I say we, uh, we collectively, 
everybody in Europe, all the member states, all the regions have, is to adapt our education system uh, to the digital world. Uh, I'll be quick. Uh, mine is, uh, has the European Commission done all the necessary to protect the human rights of the refugees? Thank you. In theory, yes. In practice, it is very difficult. Um, if the refugee, now, the refugees, let, let's see what we are speaking about. Uh, if you are an economic refugee, you are just leaving your country because you would like to have a better life somewhere else, um, that is not protected by any laws. That's illegal migration. If you are fleeing terror, war, or personal discrimination, for instance, you are a homosexual in the Arab world, whatever, uh, you fall under very concrete rules and you have the right, your case to be examined, to get the statute of a refugee. Uh, so 90% or 95% of those who come uh, do not fall into this second category. And that is a very big problem. And they come, whatever might happen. Uh, they pay a lot of money to criminal gangs in order to be uh, shipped over and, 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 and then they come en masse to places where, uh, which have not been constructed or built in order to receive uh, such an amount uh, of people. It is one of the most difficult questions because human beings are concerned. It's not about the law. It's about a human life. It's about children. Very often unaccompanied accompanied, accompanied children who are pushed by their parents out so that if they are received, their parents can join them. It is from the human point of view extraordinarily difficult. Then you have in the populations which are in those places where these masses come, the aggressivity starts to become bigger and bigger, which means that politicians, local politicians, national politicians have to fight with um, uh, an, an, an adversity of their voters against receiving more people. But these more people arrive. So how to square the circle, it's very complicated. And unfortunately, I do not believe that it is going to become much better. Okay, there was the war crisis uh, where the input was very, very big. Now there is not a war crisis anymore. The input has gone down very much, but look at Africa. Don't even think now about uh, the uh, Syria and uh, Iraq uh, question. Just look at Africa. Look at how many countries in Africa are democracies. How many countries are capable to feed their people? How the desertification is taking away land, arable land. And you can imagine then the moment on you are in politics or uh, have uh, economic responsibility, what pressure we will have from Africa. Inevitable, we can't avoid it, it's going to happen and it's going to be extraordinarily difficult. I know that there are a lot of solutions on the table, they are all theoretical. We need, for instance, well, also with the question of do we have enough trained people uh, for our digital economy, we don't. We need to, to build a system of green cards in order to import people um, who can do these kind of jobs. Uh, we need to, to, to set up some rules in order also to give a, a possibility for people from Africa to come in an ordered, orderly way to Europe. But all this is theory. The practice is that those people don't wait uh, to, to get an authorization. They just take their back and they come. And you cannot not make them come if they really want. Some of those have already tried three or four times and they come again and again. So it is 
a human crisis which is going to there which is there to stay it's not going to go away if there will be a war somewhere it's going to uh, augment very quickly but even in no war times where nobody needs to flee um, bombs even in no war times look at the world map and you will understand Hi. I would like to know how the freedom of movement can be improved in order to, like, if some states put some uh, requirements hard, hard to fill to apply for jobs or just to move to that place. Well, we do have uh, an, a freedom of movement for European citizens. Hmm? Uh, I, you, you are from what nationality? You are from Poland. You can come to work here in Spain. You can come to work in Luxembourg. And nobody can stop you from doing that. Hmm? You have the right to... Uh, that is a freedom of movement uh, for uh, European nationals. If you are coming from a third country, not member of the European Union, there are very many conditions um, so that you can come. Mm. And uh, th those conditions are national conditions. They are not European conditions. Each member state has conditions to, um, uh, which you have to fulfill if you are coming from a third uh, country, um, as a third country national to work in Europe. Uh, what, are, what are those requirements? Well, uh, to have a corporation that is going to hire you, so like a pre-contract. Okay, so yes, but you have the, yes, but you have the freedom to, to, to make this contract. If you find a contract, yeah, because, yes, that's something else. If you come and then you are heavy on, uh, a heavy burden on, this, uh, on, on, on the health system and uh, you do not make money and, 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 and it's going to be a problem for the community into which you go. But if you find a job, there is no problem. Nobody can stop you to go. This, this is a free movement. You have the free movement to, to be a tourist as much as you want, to be a student. You have also to show that you are capable to, um, to pay for, for your living. Um, but uh, if you find a work, you are free to, to move where, wherever you want. But of course, uh, we cannot... Um, you know why these rules are allowed? in order not to have the, um, the state benefit uh, seeking migration. Hmm? Uh, for instance, uh, because um, in Luxembourg, uh, really these allowances are very high, that uh, thousands of people come to Luxembourg having no intention to work there, but just getting the allowances. The allowances are not done for this purpose. The allowances are done for the purpose of somebody who falls uh, in between two nets mm, in order to recuperate this person. But they are not uh, um, done in order to have a tourism uh, for uh, the uh, social allocations. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Madame Redding. Um, there were 80 people there. Each one of them had at least one question for you. You have answered 17. That means you will have to come back. <laughs> With great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming.